and welcome to tonight's Educate to Elevate. We've entitled this one Powered by Inclusion because we want to talk about how organizations across the country, including your softball program, can truly bloom when they include people with all different abilities. We're going to get into some of the disabilities that may seem obvious and some that are hidden. We truly appreciate our panelists, their candor and willingness to talk tonight openly and freely, and we encourage you to ask any questions that you may have. If you are watching this as a recording, we hope that you reach out to the panelists, to our expert, or even just to the NFCA staff member for more information. Well, hello, everybody, again, thank you, and welcome to our Educate to Elevate session. My name is Joanna Lane. I'm the Senior Director of Education for the NFCA, and as most of you know, I see a lot of familiar names and faces. Uh, we have been doing these sessions monthly for quite a while now, and we always tackle some different topics, and this one is brand new to us in the organization, and I think it's going to be fantastic. So, as always, these sessions are dependent upon the conversation that you help us guide. So use the chat, drop your questions in. You can do that privately to me at National Fast Pitch Coaches Association, or you can do it publicly to the room, whichever you prefer. No particular order on those, uh, but whatever you throw it in, we will get it in the queue. Uh, we are thrilled to have a great group of panelists, a lot of different stories that I really am intrigued by and excited to hear those come to life. Just a couple of housekeeping things. When you entered the room, you did so on mute. If you could stay on mute, it's a large group, so that will help our audio quality. Um, and again, don't be afraid to interact in the chat. We always love to make sure that this is exactly what you are looking for and how it can apply to your own program. So what we'll do is we will go around the horn with our panelists, let them introduce themselves to you and tell you a little bit of their own story and how they relate to the topic. And then we'll get right into the questions. So uh, we're going to start tonight with Dr. Jodell Hero. Uh, Jodell, if you want to kick us off a little bit about who you are, where you're from, what you're doing, and your tie to the topic. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to do that. So my name is Jodell Hero. Um, I'm currently an associate professor at CMU, Central Michigan University, and I've been in this role for the last eight years. Um, I've been in education for almost 30 years, all of which has included working with students and individuals with disabilities or preparing future teachers for working with students with disabilities. Um, and I, you know, I think about because I teach um, pre-service teachers, we always ask them to think about like, why did you choose teaching? And honestly, I can't. I think about this all the time. Like I can't even tell you why I chose to, to pursue a career in special education um, back in college. But what I can say is that I've dedicated my entire career to it. So um, I started in the public schools and I taught in, in K-12 schools for 20 years and then made the decision um, to go back and get a PhD, like somewhere in my late thirties, thought that was a great idea. <laughs> so I decided to do that. Um, and partially because I, I really wanted to be part of the effort to prepare the, the next generation of teachers for working with students with disabilities. And at that time, um, I really wanted to work with teachers who um, weren't even, weren't special education teachers, were general education teachers who were working in classrooms with students with disabilities. And what I learned throughout that process in my PhD program is that I actually have disabilities myself. So I was diagnosed with um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, the inattentive type and generalized anxiety disorder in my 30s. And um, I actually, that helped kind of explain a lot of the things that I experienced as a, a young person and even in middle school, high school, college. Um, I, it really helped me kind of understand myself better and why I process things differently and reacted to things differently and understood things differently. Um, so it's really kind of helped me um, even dig a little deeper into the field of disability. So um, after I received my PhD, I decided to um, go on because, you know, you can't just stop with a PhD. You got to keep going. Um, so I got a graduate certificate in disability studies from the University of Hawaii in Manoa. And that field is different. And it, it, it took, a, took me in a completely different direction. So I was in special education most of my life. And with disability studies, that field really focuses on the lived experiences of people with disabilities and 
really works towards disability justice by challenging stereotypes and myths of disability. So it's very, it's, it was very different from what I had understood about disability in my profession. So the very first thing that I learned in that program is that disability is the largest minority group that anyone can join at any time, whether temporarily or permanently. And even though I think on some level we know that and we understand that, it, it doesn't always really sink in that that is um, that we should be thinking about disability all the time. And so for me, that was life changing. And I thought we really need to educate our our students, our college students about this. And so we developed a minor in disability studies and community inclusion that any student in any discipline can take here at CMU. And the idea is that they can start to think about how issues of disability impact or intersect with their discipline. And I think for me, um, one of the most rewarding things that's come from that is um, that college students are actually saying that this is the first time in a college course where they felt that they could safely disclose that they have a disability. And so all this time I've been thinking about preparing teachers, but not really thinking about how our students in, in colleges and universities um, are experiencing disability. So um, I just wanna say I am super thrilled to be here um, in the company of these amazing panelists and somewhat intimidated because I am not an athlete or a coach and I would say I'm not an expert either, but um, I look forward to, to engaging in a really important conversation and thanks so much for having me. You bet. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go next to Christy Knoyer, St. Louis University. Coach? First and foremost, thanks, Carol. Carol reached out to me and uh, said, Christy, you'd be, you'd be great if you're comfortable. I said, I'm in. I'm in. Um, it wasn't that quick, but I appreciate asking. And just to be able to share stories, to be able to, you can reach one or two people and be able to help. That's why I'm on the call. And uh, again, appreciate you, Carol, for, uh, for reaching out. Um, yeah, I'm the head coach at St. Louis U. I've uh, played my college career as a middle infielder at University of Notre Dame. Um, after my college career, I tried out for the Olympics, made a level two tryout. Um, we're going back to uh, going back to 96. Um, after that, did a service project. I coached at Purdue with Carol for eight years in the Big Ten. Uh, was a head coach at Tulsa, an associate head coach at SIU Carbondale, uh, currently the head coach at SLU. So I've been doing this for 25 years. Um, and during that time, and actually goes back to my days with, with Carol, I was diagnosed with uh, multiple sclerosis, MS. You may be familiar with it. It's a, um, MS is a disease of the central nervous system. Um, MS, multiple sclerosis, multiple scars. Uh, the concept is your body thinks there's a problem. It attacks it. Uh, it tends to attack the brain. Um, what it will do is like a, if you have something plugged in and you have a, a cord to that, the uh, mice in your house and the mice are eating that cord and all of a sudden you short circuit and the light goes out. Well, my lights don't go out, but it short circuits and every now and then you have a, a it's called an exacerbation. You get a moment of double vision. You get a moment of um, something funny going on in your leg, something funny going on in your hand. I've tried to dial a phone. This is back in the day and I appreciate Carol's patience with me. Um, but back in the day, you dial a phone and my brain's telling me you know, 314, 977, but it's not coming out because those wires are crossed. Um, and I, again, I'm just surrounded by good people. Uh, where, it, where it started for me too, and I'm going to call Carol out a little bit. We joked about this story. Um, my MS started, or actually it started much before, but where it presented itself was when I was coaching at, uh, at Purdue. And we're at the Alamo Bowl. Carol and I are going to uh, and we already joked a little bit to call her out, but we're at the Alamo Bowl. We're down in Texas and um, Purdue's playing. And I look at Carol, and again, it's a night game. I look at Carol. I said, are you seeing four teams on the field? I'm looking, I'm looking out and I see four teams. And uh, I look at her, I said, you had Shinerbach. I had Shinerbach. I don't think we drank that much, but I'm seeing a lot of teams out there. And she starts laughing and we giggle. And, you know, I watch the game like this and we do our thing, wake up the next morning. I'm still seeing double. And so that's when to get it checked out, figure it all out. Um, my symptoms, again, have been double vision, have been fatigued, some of those delayed responses. Um, but I've been fortunate that it's a relapsing remitting form of MS, not the progressive that uh, 
that is out there. And I, like I said, I take medication. I do a shot every other day. Um, been managing MS throughout my career. Um, and I think my message, and, and I, I threw this out to Carol and, and welcome. If I see you guys at convention and you want to talk more, I'm more than happy to, to talk because um, we I've, I've helped some people along the way that have had MS. Um, I even joked that I went to my first my first and my last support group. When I went to the support group, everyone was, oh, it's terrible. The shots hurt, this, this, this. And that, that was my last support group I went to and then found other people to talk to along the way. So everybody has a different story. But I guess my message um, on this call tonight, I want to be a college coach. I want to be active with my friends, my family. I want to travel. I want to dream dreams and all the things, anything I can. And I sound like a commercial, but um, I have MS, but it doesn't have me. Um, I, it doesn't define me. I know I have limitations, but they don't define me. I know that it's part of my life, but it doesn't define who I am. And uh, if there's messaging to go out to people that have disabilities and working through it, um, I can, you can still live a long, healthy, productive life, wonderful career. MS is not, uh, it's not a death sentence. It's, it's challenges, um, but your disabilities don't mean you're, you're not, you're not capable of doing what you want to do. If you want to do something, go for it. Ask for help. Do your thing. Um, at times, I make it sound easy, but um, like I said, it's surround yourself with good people. And Carol, I can't thank you enough. And and staff that I've had along the way, family. It's just been uh, uh, something that you can handle. So there's a there's the brief version. Thank you very much, Coach. Appreciate that. Uh, next, we're going to go to Justin Burns, Coach. Hi, my name is Justin Burns, head softball coach, intramural game room coordinator at Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C. Um, I just want to let you know, as a I, FYI, I was born in deaf in Toronto, Canada. My parents are also deaf. My only sister is hearing and is heavily involved with the deaf community. Uh, and my sister currently works with deaf blind clients in Toronto. I also have three sons. Uh, the oldest is deaf and currently attends Gallaudet University and is a freshman. So I'm really proud of him. Uh, he's watching us. And Gallaudet is the only university in which all programs and services are specially defined to accommodate deaf and hard of hearing students. It's the only one like that in the world. I grew up playing fast pitch. So not baseball, but fast pitch specifically uh, as a pitcher to be in the Toronto area. And my sister was always with me because my former coach at the time was unable to communicate with me um, because he was hearing and did not know sign language. And so my sister functioned as an interpreter for nine years with me. Um, I also played for the Gallaudet baseball team. And then after that, I graduated and I became a coach myself to two deaf school softball teams for 13 years, uh, both elementary and high school, and then coached at the college level uh, for seven years. I'm in my fifth year as head coach now. I have experienced barriers, uh, both as an athlete when I was a student and as a coach over the years. And still today, there are ongoing barriers that we still experience. So this topic is very important for us to share because we definitely need to educate each other about what everyone is experiencing and understand what obstacles there are and how it is that we can come together to overcome them. Like as one example, when I was playing either baseball or fast pitch, Many of the players would be talking and I would have no idea what they were saying. So I definitely wouldn't have full access uh, to the panel, even through an interpreter. And on the Gallaudet team, we're a deaf university. We're a deaf team and that's great. But what the other teams are talking about uh, is something we still don't have full access to. And then as a coach, I always struggle with the refs uh, who don't know sign and I can do a little bit of lip reading, 
but they have to, you know, they'll often ask the athletic director or someone else like, hey, tell him this, tell him that instead of talking directly to me, which is what I want, you know, you talk to me. And if I need some assistance understanding you, then I'll pull someone in rather than going around me. So that's an example of where that full access doesn't happen. Or from Florida, there's a deaf ref who will come to Gallaudet and I feel so blessed to have a ref who signs. It's incredible. And then other universities, other hearing teams struggle in those situations communicating with a deaf umpire. So there can be that sort of role reversal in that situation. But I just think it's such an important topic uh, to re you know, remind different businesses, universities, organizations, the federal and state governments about hiring deaf and hard of hearing people, because many people are still unemployed or underemployed because this feeling exists out there that, oh, we don't wanna provide cart services or we don't wanna provide interpreters. So those struggles persist to this day. And in the month of October uh, is this disability awareness month, which is important, but it needs to be not just once a year that we think about these issues, but that there's an ongoing effort made to keep these in mind. Thank you very much, Coach. Appreciate that. Uh, moving on to our next panelist, let's go to Taylor McQuillan. Taylor? Hi, everyone. My name is Taylor McQuillan. Um, I am a pitcher still playing softball. Um, I'm an All-American from the University of Arizona and currently just finished a uh, playing with the Mexican national team on our journey to the Tokyo Olympics this past summer. And I just finished up my second season of Athletes Unlimited uh, professional softball about three-ish weeks ago. Um, so just trying to get back to normal life, uh, still living in Tucson, Arizona, where I went to uh, school for college. So um, I guess you could say it kind of grew on me a little bit out here, um, but I live out here still giving uh, personal pitching instruction with individual group and virtual lessons, um, as well as working with some teams and organizations out in the area, just trying to continue to develop softball in Tucson and uh, work to grow the game out here um, while I'm still out here. Um, I was born with Duane syndrome in my left eye, uh, which means that I am now legally blind in my left eye. And I have been this way pretty much since birth. Um, I had a partial, I was partially blind, I think when I was born and after about five surgeries um, on my eye, on my left eye and three surgeries with uh, my eardrums, they had determined that I am now legally blind in my left eye and partially deaf in my left ear. Um, I don't have any uh, severities when it comes to being able to hear clearly um, or be able to communicate in that aspect, um, but definitely growing up trying to uh, play a whole bunch of different sports and figure out kind of, well, what can I be good at? Um, and, and what can I learn how to do since I do have kind of a disability being able to have a peripheral on the left side. Um, my parents threw me into a bunch of different sports, a bunch of different activities to see what I could be good at or um, what I was able to do. And I just fell in love with the game of softball at about age eight and never stopped playing ever since. And the biggest thing that I've learned from not being able to see and not having the peripheral in the, the left eye is just super heavy on communication, being as transparent as possible with the people on the field around me. Um, and that wasn't always easy. I think for the longest time, I tried to not hide, but didn't really talk about how I was blind in my left eye. And I wouldn't really ex have to explain it unless friends or classmates or, um, you know, anybody would come up and approach me and say, hey, like, what's going on with your eye if you're comfortable talking about it? Um, and that's when I would kind of open up. And it was about when I was 17 years old, a senior in high school, I had a reporter show up to the school and asked to talk to me. And the first question he asked was, okay, so we heard that you were legally blind in your left eye. Can we do a story on it? And I was kind of taken back because I wasn't aware that it was a big deal or that people knew. Um, and so the the quote unquote disability that I have got brought to light as I had gotten older. Um, and I kind of used it as an experience instead of um, saying I have a disability. I use it as that 
kind of turning point to say, you know what, I can guide people in the right direction and, and give them somebody to look up to and, and give them that inspiration to keep on playing and keep on doing whatever they want to do um, because I'm able to live with a disability that I have. Um, and so ever since then, I've been nothing but proud to share my story. And um, I'm super excited to be on this panel and, and answer any questions that may come our way. So thank you guys for having me. Thank you, Taylor. Appreciate that. And now uh, we've got another picture in the house. So we'll kick it over to Kat Osterman. Kat. A uh, newly three week retired um, pitcher now. Um, Taylor and I just both finished up Athletes Unlimited season two, three weeks ago. Um, I am an All American from Texas, um, played with the US national team for 12 or 13 years, um, three Olympics. Um, but I really grew up in the national team, joining in 01 as an 18 year old and um, taking the first step away in 2010 after we were voted out of the Olympics. Um, but um, on the panel today, Carol asked me actually last week if I would join after I had shared my post um, on social media about um, kind of dealing with, living with, figuring out um, that I have anxiety. Um, I did that through our USOPC sports psychologist um, during COVID, actually, um, when I joined the Scrapyard Dogs, which turned into This Is Us. Um, as proud as I was of everything we were doing, it, there was something, there was something in me that just didn't allow me to fully be able to function like I wanted to. And um, once I got home from that, then my husband was laughing because there were times my phone would buzz and I would just like chuck it across the car. And he's like, that's not necessary. I'm like, I don't want it near me. And um, just did some soul searching, obviously reached out for help with our sports psychologist, um, talked with him at length um, a couple of times. And then finally, he's like, I think you need to call your general physician and talk to him. And um, so I did. And I got on medication, which is great. Um, but more I kind of did research and self-reflected. Um, there's a lot of situations in life, in softball, um, where I think I had learned to manage or people realized that those situations were overwhelming for me and they were able to, I don't want to say protect me, but just be able to guide me through it without knowing, without me knowing really that I was overwhelmed. Um, sometimes, you know, I, I had friends once I finally said, you know, hey guys, this is what's going on. My inner circle, they were like, really? We just always kind of thought that's you, like that's who you are. And I'm like, maybe, but I, but having to now look back and and see situations and like could have been handled way differently if I knew what I was battling and what was going on. Um, a lot of mine comes from, I don't want to say not being in control of the situation, but having absolutely none. Um, so it's perfect. I'm a pitcher because if I were a hitter, I probably would not um, be able to do that successfully. But just it came from a lot of situations to where I knew I was following my guidelines or what I knew was right and wrong or socially acceptable or whatever, but other people didn't, but I didn't, I didn't have control of the outcome or what they were doing. And I was kind of left alone to function with it. And so, um, yeah, I'm here to discuss kind of now how I handle it going forward. Um, cause there's still our battles, but, um, at the same time, looking back, um, I am very blessed with my college coach, Connie Clark, because I look back and see, I think how she managed it with me without knowing. Um, because she did a really good job and um, just kind of how my, I think my parents helped me too. Cause when I told my mom, she said, well, yeah, I could have told you that. And I was just like, did someone want to clue me in somewhere in my own life um, that this was all going on. But um, yeah, I think from the mental health side, it's important that athletes are able to voice what they're dealing with and everybody not racing to like, Oh, hug you and say, it's okay. Like that's not what they need necessarily, but how can you be there for your athletes and how can you help um, not necessarily make accommodations, but what is it that you can help to ease, to ease their situations? And, and what is it that sometimes triggers it? You know, it's mine's not triggered because we lose a softball game. Like it's again, a lot of situations where I don't have control or where I am perceiving that what people do is not acceptable. Um, and, uh, that's where a lot of it comes in play, but just being able to hear your athletes and then help them function from that. Thank you very much, Kat. Appreciate that. And Joe Dell, I'm going to come back to you with this question and then we can go around for any panelists that wants to jump in. But, um, Kat mentioned something that, that I thought might be pertinent in, uh, with COVID and with everything that we've been through in the last, you know, year plus several months, are some of the hidden disabilities that we're hearing about and talking about, have those 
um, been exacerbated by all of the things that we've experienced as a community? And is that something that you have seen more, talked about more um, with your students and in your research? Um, that's a really interesting question. And I think it's, it's complex too. So um, while some students because of COVID have experienced, um, I think increased anxiety, um, partially due to isolation, um, also the lack of control and being able to control your own um, environment and your health. Um, other students have actually flourished. So we have some students with autism who this is like they were built for, many of them were built for this, like the, the online meetings, online classes, and like that is more, um, could be more in their wheelhouse. So I think we have um, a convergence of things. So we have some students that are really struggling still trying to navigate that and some who are actually doing quite well. And some, somehow um, I think what we need coming out of this is being able to bridge that gap, that we don't just do everything in person and we don't do everything just online, but that we can really bridge the gap between um, what people need because of what we've learned through COVID. Um, I will say though, in the classes that I teach, the, the anxiety that students are experiencing seems to be heightened. Um, but one thing I think that is different maybe now than when I was in college is that students are a little bit more open to talking about it and sharing their experiences. Um, and, and I think that's a good thing. The more we talk about it, the more we um, you know, share our experiences, the less isolating it is. And, and we can start to kind of destigmatize the whole idea of, of disability. So does that answer your question? Absolutely. I, I tend to go on a tangent, so. <laughs> no, that's that's perfectly fine. And you know, we've got uh, several in the chat, so we'll just jump around on these. And again, panelists, you can throw a hand up if you want in or, or just simply jump in on any of these. Uh, but the first question to talk about and shoot to everyone is, um, you know, what has your disability taught you? And is there something that you've learned through the process that you think um, is pertinent to share with others? So let's go back, Coach Knoyer, let's have you take this one from the start. Oh, I got that mute button down now. Um, figured that thing out. Uh, you know, and that's, there's, I don't even know if there's one thing to, to point out. There's so many things to learn. I think one of the big ones is you did to, uh, to lean on others, um, to surround yourself with, I said that initially, surround yourself with good people, uh, that you don't have to do it alone and you don't have to manage all those questions and not alone and you go through it. And, and I, I, I'm going to kind of go back to your COVID question a little bit. When COVID came up, um, you know, it's again, MS is, um, you know, mine's not severe. And I go through my day to day after COVID and after you see things going on. And like I said, talking to Carol, I, I guess what I've learned is, again, not have to do it alone, but if I have an opportunity to help somebody else out to use that, and it could be just a conversation, just something that you're not alone in this. You don't have to tackle this alone. So I, I guess the, the messaging or the, the learning in a roundabout way is you're not alone and uh, you don't have to do this alone. I, I hear Kat talk about it, Taylor talk about it. You, know, you talk about your families and you talk about um, peop good people that are with you. And I would, I would say that uh, when, when you get a diagnosis, you're like, oh, it's just that spotlight's on you. I've got to handle it. There are others that uh, they're not going to judge you. They're going to help you. And I think learning that was a, was a big step. Thank you very much. Uh, Justin, same question to you, whether it's for yourself or your student athletes. Uh, what are some things that your disability has taught you? Okay. Um... When I think about self-advocacy, I think of examples like, you know, the umpire trying to talk to someone else. And I'm like, no, you talk to me. That's what self-advocacy could look like. Uh, and I might ask for an interpreter to talk to an ump in another situation. Um, with student advocacy, I'm making sure that I'm teaching them to be proud of who they are as a deaf and hard of hearing person, that it's okay to not feel ashamed about who they are, just like Kat said, there's nothing wrong with who you are. And I believe it was Joe Dell who mentioned about the phrase hearing impairment. And lots of deaf and hard of hearing people actually are uncomfortable with that terminology, hearing impairment. Um, you know, so you can tell them that uh, that's considered a negative way 
of framing who we are. It focuses on the hearing loss, whereas we talk about deaf and hard of hearing people just being a communication barrier or a I language barrier. Thank you very much. And Joe Dell, coming back to you, we talked a little bit about this on a, on a planning call of, you know, defining disability and what, and what that means and how it's different. And, and we can really get lost in some of that. Can you, can you get into that a little bit for, for the group and what that looks like or how we can learn from that? So I was just thinking as Justin was talking about, um, that's one of the things that I teach in classes about the social construction of disability and that there are certain environments where your impairment may may not um, may not feel disabling um, because you have access and it, it is all about access when we when we think about disability it has everything to do with like how you experience your impairment it has everything to do with how you're able to access and interact with and participate in your environment and so when we think about disability as socially constructed socially constructed it's just this idea that impairment exists like that's a fact but whether or not you feel disabled by it really has everything to do with your environment. And so when we think about even just something like, like for, for me with ADHD and mine's an attentive type, but I've worked with students that had the hyperactive type, you know, you're not gonna see that um, if they are busy, if students are in athletics, for example, and their body's moving all the time, you're not gonna notice that they you might not notice that they have ADHD, but if you're in a classroom where the expectation is you have to sit and study for six and a half hours a day, you're likely going to see it. Um, so it's just the idea that, you know, the more we can create this, this world, this environment where everyone can have increased access, the less disabling the impairments feel. So um, I think that's probably the biggest takeaway for my students is understanding the difference between impairment and disability and really the idea that um, the world isn't really built for people with impairments. The world is built for people who are able-bodied, able-minded. So, um, and the more we can think about creating this space that's more inclusive, the less disabling it is. And it's really better for everyone. So when we think about designing spaces and places and experiences for people with disabilities, everybody benefits. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, Taylor, let's come back to you about some things that you have learned through the process. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think the the biggest thing is, um, like I said before, learning how to communicate and and try to be as transparent with others as possible, um, it, whether it's on the field, off the field, whatever the situation is. I think the, like I said, the older I got, the more I realized like, oh, wow, this is a little bit different like we'd be sitting at arizona conditioning after practice and we would do these um these conditioning drills with speed and footwork where we would have these lights that would be in our peripherals and when you see the light go off you would go and i'd be sitting there and i was like okay well somebody's gonna have to tell me when this light on the left side goes off unless i'm just staring at it and realize that the right one went off so um or i would take a step back and and it, it didn't uh I, it didn't take me out of the drill. It just limited what I was able to do. Um, but I think just, just kind of going back to um, what Jodell was saying about <clears throat> being put in those in those positive environments and and the real world is is made for people without disabilities i think that's 100 percent true um and and you know for people with whatever disability they have just learning how to adapt i think that's the biggest thing um but for me it was kind of the opposite because i know i've never really seen my disability as a disability and um i remember my freshman year going into arizona and even before my parents would always you know tell these coaches like, Hey, we just want to be transparent with you as well. Taylor is legally blind in her left eye. Is that going to be an issue like with her recruiting process at this university or playing on this travel ball team, or even in the rec league, just telling the coaches and all of our, my coaches were, were super awesome and amazing about it. And they were like, no, like this isn't going to limit Taylor from anything on our team. Um, and, and then transitioning and moving forward to Arizona my freshman year. Um, one of the first things that happened, I got brought into the um, doctor's office after doing the physicals and going through the whole process of no, I don't even try the, the left eye test. Like I can tell you right now, I can't see anything the second I close my right eye. So I'm telling you I'm blind in it. Let's just move on. And they make you do it anyway. Um, I got brought into the doctor's office and they were like, Hey, um, so this year you're going to it's, it's a liability for you to step on the field for the university and 
not have any protection on your eyes or your face. And I was like, okay, well, I'm 18 years old. I've been playing softball for over 10 years. I've never worn anything on my face before, let alone a mask, goggles, um, the lacrosse mask, whatever you want to call it. And they were like, no, you have to, to try out all these things and, and, and wear something on your face to protect your eyes. So it's not a liability to the school. And so my entire freshman year of college, after already being super uncomfortable with having to come into, you know, college, a whole new environment, learning how to be on your own and, and wanting to perform to the best of your abilities. Now I got tacked on with, oh, now your disability is an issue for the school. Um, and after the entire freshman year of just saying, you know what, I'm going to buy into this. I'm going to just you know, do what the school wants. Um, my, my brother and my mom and I had approached coach Candrea in his office and said, you know, like we, we feel like this is a little bit of an uncomfortable conversation, but we're willing to have it because we don't want Taylor's disability to be seen as more than how she feels it actually is. And, um, Coach was like, okay, you know what, what do, what do we have to do to make Taylor the most comfortable? Do you need me to write a letter? Do you need me to talk to the school's attorneys? Let's do whatever we have to do. And entering my sophomore year in a matter of three weeks, I didn't have to wear the goggles or any sort of face mask at all, if that's what I chose to do. And um, the attorneys and my parents were like, we'll sign papers, we'll do whatever we have to do. You know, this is on Taylor, this is what she wants to do. And the, the school was more than willing to help and, and ad adapt and let me be who I am um, and, and allow me to be as comfortable as I could be. And, um, you know, it's it's solely because what, what Christy was saying, I, coach had my back and, and he was like, I, I want my athlete, I want the person that I'm going to see at the field every day to be as successful as possible. And that was just me being able to communicate and be as transparent as possible to everyone around me instead of trying to just let things happen and me having the best support system that I could possibly have. Um, and, and I think those are the, the two really crucial aspects that have happened in my life that I would encourage upon everybody else, just finding that strong support system and not being afraid to communicate and, and lay out how you feel because that's helped me tremendously. Well, thank you very much. And it's a terrific segue to Samantha Ekstrand, who we keep on all of our calls to throw the very difficult questions to. Uh, so Samantha, I just want your reaction as you're listening to this um, as the, uh, the legal counsel um, of what, what you think and what coaches should be aware of. The mute monster got gotcha, you, Sam. It's happening to everyone tonight. I swear I pressed the button. I swear I did. Um, third time's the charm. So I was shaking my head as you were telling your story, Taylor, and I'm so sorry. Um, that sounds like attorneys who really miss the boat. And, and I really don't, um, I cringe when I hear that because they just lose sight of what the issue is and what the purpose of the law is. And it is not to make you feel different or um, you know, extra anything, <laughs> extra burden, extra liability. I mean, what a horrible thing to, to call you in your condition, right? Like you're a liability for the school. Um, you're not, you're an asset and you just have something, an impairment, something that's a little bit different um, that we have to you know, figure out how to best support you. And, but I think the takeaway is, and it's sad, um, is you have to advocate, right? And kudos you know, to your coach for stepping up and, and recognizing, and coaches do that. Sometimes with disabilities, um, they get a little bit nervous about how to, but it certainly is, does help when you have some years of experience um, to say to your athletic administration, wait a minute, this is not intended, supposed to be an extra burden or make, um, make this athlete feel um, different, segregated, you know, whatever that negative feeling is. And, and a lot of times those extra precautions or measures, um, well, I'd like to give people the benefit of the doubt you know, in situations like that, I, I frankly don't, I think that they really missed it, but I'm glad that it worked out, you know, in time for you to feel like you could play comfortably. So I think the takeaway for coaches on the call, you know, is you, you absolutely have student athletes on your roster um, or will have, you know, a student athlete on your roster with a disability. And sometimes you'll know, and sometimes you won't. Um, and if you, you have to walk that line of privacy very carefully as well, you know, whether they want to disclose that to you or not. Um, but when you are made aware, you know, it's not, um, it isn't something extra. 
It is just something a little bit different that we need to figure out how to support. And if you approach it from that mindset and from that perspective, um, I think that you, you know, will be well on your way and listening, you know, listening to what the needs are um, and not just making assumptions and being able to have conversations with your, with your athlete, with, you know, her parents, with your athletic administration, because again, your role as a, as a coach is you're responsible for the health, safety, well-being environment of your team and the athletes who play in your team. And so that's where, you know, I think you get pulled into this and that's your responsibility. So I'm, I'm glad that ultimately it worked out for you. But um, I think in this world of disabilities and my husband does a lot of work um, in educational disabilities and kids who have learned disabilities in school settings and making sure they get accommodations and support and um, the amount of advocacy that needs to be done at this point in time is, can be frustrating and a little sad, but it, we just, it is what it is. And at the end of the day, we got to make sure that these students and these student athletes um, get the support and feel supported in these environments so that they can learn and flourish um, just like the students without the disabilities. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And uh, Kat, let's go to you and you can round out this question and then I'm going to stick with you on another one. So anything particular that you haven't shared already that you really think that you've learned through this process? Got it. Um, the first is that there's not something wrong with you. Like, I think everyone thinks about disability and the connotation or even mental health issues and the connotation uh -huh. goes to there's something wrong with them. There's nothing wrong. We're just a little bit different and everyone's different in any which way. And again, no two people who have the same diagnosis of a disability, or is it going to be the same? Like you're not going to handle them the same because they're two totally different people. Um, so I think the first was me realizing there was nothing, there wasn't something wrong with me. Cause I literally was at a point where I couldn't function. Like I said, and I, I, I was basically asking what is wrong with me. Um, but the other thing is, and we've all touched on it is, there are more people out there that want to help than they want to hinder or they want to, you know, shut you down. Obviously Taylor had a situation to where they didn't want to necessarily be the help. Eventually she got it. But most of us, when you, when you confide in your friends, your family, whatever it is, there are people that want to help. Um, and that's where, I mean, for, from the get go, once I was feeling what I was feeling, I reached out to a teammate who had been very vocal about her dealing with anxiety. And I was like, what does it feel like? what, like, what are, what do you experience? I know it's not gonna be the same, but like, maybe you can help me understand and wrap my head around. Like, is this, is what I'm experiencing similar? Is it something that I should go that route? I didn't want to self-diagnose. I just wanted like, what you hear people say, oh, I have anxiety. Okay. That can look different in so many different ways. And so it was, there's more people that want to help. And then the other thing thinking about reflecting back is in help in being and help and people who helped me manage it before I even really knew I had it. It wasn't so much of a, a coddling atmosphere. Um, I can remember one specific situation in college um, that now that I think about it, like I know exactly what it was, was anxiety. And, it, and a lot of my time when I deal, when I get way anxious, I get a little um, irritated. I'm not the most pleasant person to communicate with. Like, it's just, I get on edge and um my catcher, unfortunately, got suspended before the first tournament of my senior year. And here it is supposed to be our great, this is the year kind of thing. And we're going to Arizona and I don't have my catcher. And I'm supposed to throw to a freshman who I've barely thrown bullpens to. And after the catcher had to stand in front of us and apologize and coach basically, you know, handed down her suspension in front of the team, which at the time was indefinite. And I was just like, you, you can't, you can't do this. Like, you can't do this to me, like both of you. Like I, and so here I am freaking out and now I'm supposed to go throw a bullpen to this poor freshman catcher. And I wasn't, um, I wasn't very nice. I wasn't rude and like telling her she didn't know what she was doing, but I just wasn't pleasant in which you would hope that I would ease her into it and, you know, be like, Hey, we got this, we can do this. But because I had zero control over what was happening in my mind, it was like building up as like this monumental thing. Coach Clark pulled me into the office and looked point blank and said, I know you're upset, but quit being a bear. Bear was the exact word she used. I'm not covering for another word, but, and I was like, what? She was like, you're eating that poor kid alive. You want to paw and scratch at every person that comes near you right now, quit. And I was just like, I had to take a step back, but I needed one to be called out on it, but two time. I also didn't have time to process what just happened. It was literally like, Hey, this happened. She's suspended. She said, sorry, but she's still not coming. Okay. Let's go to practice. And so in 
dealing with it. And as I've gotten last year and a half or so, um, knowing when I get in those situations, it's about giving myself extra time or asking for extra time. Like, Hey, can I have five minutes? I need to go wrap my head around what's going on right now, because I'm going to spiral out of control if I can't. And then I'm going to be somebody that nobody wants to be around. And I don't want to be that. Um, so I think I've learned that one, it's so many people want to help, but two, it's you recognizing sometimes, um, when it's, when it's hitting and, and just saying, Hey, time out. Like it's okay to ask for time out. Very rarely is it hitting in a crucial, like I have to keep going type setting, um, at least for me. And so, um, that's kind of been the two, the two takeaways, um, is that uh, there's nothing wrong. There's people that want to help, or I guess three takeaways and two, a lot of times just taking time out, um, will help you mentally at least settle down enough that you can start to process. Thank you very much. And, and that's the, the next question. Great segue for me. Appreciate that um, on the advocacy piece. And so if we can go to this a little bit of, of how can people self-advocate for whatever it is they might need? And then how can coaches on the call continue to be an advocate for their student athletes, um, whether whether they know exactly what they're doing or not? So, uh, Joe Dell, as promised, I'm going to start with you almost every time to lay some groundwork for us. But um, when you think of advocacy, self and uh, in this situation, a, a coach, a professor, someone that's, that's in a position of, of power, so to speak, what should these two parties be aware of when it comes to this? So, I mean, advocacy obviously is very important. Um, I think um, having a real awareness of what your impairment is and what you need. Um, you can't, it's really difficult to advocate for yourself if you're not entirely sure you know, what your needs are. I think it's also important to know what's, um, that accommodations or advocating for yourself is really generally about it, getting accommodations so that you can um, do what you need to do and have what you need in order to be successful at it. So I think at advocacy, our own um, advocacy has a lot to do with, you know, knowing the law, knowing what your rights are, um, but I think advocacy in terms of like coaches advocating for their athletes, um, I was listening to um, just this last um, response to the, to the question and the whole time I kept thinking like, um, we have a tendency as, you know, non-disabled people have a tendency to kind of, um, we're using our own bodies as a frame of reference. So we don't actually believe people with impairments when they tell us things like we didn't believe that um, you know, that they need a particular thing. So the mask that she was talking about, um, you know, when someone with an impairment is telling you, I don't need this, or I, I, I do need that, we have to actually honor that. And when you advocate for someone with a disability, you have to take the time to get to know them, take the time to find out what they need, what they want, and then you can successfully advocate for them. Um, a lot of times people just time, you know, people do want to help. And a lot of times we swoop in and help in ways that are not actually helpful. So I think before we do any kind of advocacy for an individual with an impairment, we have to find out what they need. Thank you very much. Uh, Justin, let's come to you. Um, any advice you would give for coaches or suggestions on the best way to advocate for student athletes um, or for someone to advocate for themselves? Okay. Um, when I think about self-advocacy, I think of examples like, you know, the umpire trying to talk to someone else. And I'm like, no, you talk to me. That's what self-advocacy could look like. Uh, and I might ask for an interpreter to talk to an ump in another situation. Um, with student advocacy, I'm making sure that I'm teaching them to be proud of who they are as a deaf and hard of hearing person, that it's okay to not feel ashamed about who they are. Just like Kat said, there's nothing wrong with who you are. And I believe it was Joe Dell who mentioned about the phrase hearing impairment. And lots of deaf and hard of hearing people actually are uncomfortable with that terminology, hearing impairment. Um, you know, so you can tell them that uh, that's considered a negative way of framing who we are. It focuses on the hearing loss, whereas we talk about deaf and hard of hearing people just being a communication barrier or a I, language barrier. Christy, same question. Anything you would add? I had two thoughts, and I got the mute button again. Still rolling with it. I think um, 
a, a, just a story. I remember playing at Notre Dame, Liz Miller was coaching and um, it was one of those exacerbations where I couldn't see the ball. And, and at that time, and it kind of goes back to some of the discussion, Kat, you were saying about, you didn't know what it was necessarily at the time. I just thought I was being terrible as a shortstop. Coach Miller still hit me the ball, hit me the ball. I'm like, hit me more, hit me more. I'm in tears. She kept going. I couldn't see. I couldn't see the depth of the ball. I couldn't, it wasn't diagnosed at the time, virus, whatever the case may be, but um, we both got frustrated. Um, and multiple years later, I tell coaches not to make her feel bad. But I said, hey, we figured this one out. I wasn't as bad as you may have thought at the time. But that, uh, that moment of that depth perception and that moment of going through it and going through it and keep working and keep working. And I take it to, you know, coaching now what I'm doing. And it, maybe this doesn't an, answer the advocacy, but I had a kid that was struggling again, fielding ball, fielding ball. And, and I, it's not, not a bad kid and not a bad, bad uh, player. Finally got her eyes checked and had to get contacts. And I know this is something kind of small, but the disability helped me learn to ask better questions and to realize, okay, I could just beat this kid to death and just keep hitting and keep hitting and keep hitting. Um, but I stepped back and said, you know what, let's get your eyes checked. Let's figure out what it is. So kid got, kid got contacts. Um, and again, talking about advocacy and I, I like the, uh, the language we've been using, um, you know, Taylor, you said that never seen my disability as a disability um, and nothing wrong, just different. Um, I've, I've said it before. It doesn't define me. I think the advocacy piece is still having your student athletes set the goals that they want. May it look a little different? Yeah, but still setting goals still. And, and how are we going to work within those work with with your limitations, with your disabilities, whatever you want to call them, work with that, but still set your goals, still still pushing for those. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Coach, um, thinking about your playing experiences, Taylor and Kat, we'll go to you two on this one. Are there things that you wish coaches um, would, would have done or could have done to help transition the times that were difficult for you in any way, shape, or form? Anything in, in hindsight that you think about? Taylor, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, I don't, I, like I said, most of the coaches uh, that I could play for, like, I can't even think of one off the top of my head that had ever, you know, taken my disability and ran with it the, in the wrong direction. Um, they have been super helpful. Um, and I think the, the biggest thing is that they, I, treated me like a normal person. <laughs> they treated me like just another normal athlete on their team. Um, and my teammates did the same. So I, I've had teammates that, um, you know, have, have spoken about me in, um, interviews that I've overheard or that I've seen that have said, you know, I, I forget that Taylor is blind in her left eye. I don't even, sometimes I don't even remember. Um, and to me, that's a big win because that means I'm doing something right to, um, be normal in their eyes. Um, and, and I think that it's helped more than hurt because my coaches have never said like, oh, she's, she's different. Um, they've always been like, yeah, she's, she's an athlete. And, and when you talk about athletes specifically, they love hearing, yeah, she's an athlete, you know, and, and she's, she's a good person. She's a great teammate. And I've never had somebody say like, oh yeah, well, she's legally blind as like the first thing that somebody has said, or a coach has said, or a, a teammate has said. And, and to me, that means that I've, I've always been in the right place. I've always been around the right people, surrounded myself around the best teammates, the best coaches. Um, and they've just only added to my support system. And I, I find that more times Times than not, I'm the one that um, will be talking about I'm legally blind in my left eye, or yeah, I have issues here. Let's make sure we're just communicating. Or um, you, the, I'm the one that tends to bring it up more than others, and I, I think that's that's a big win. So I don't know if I've ever ha been in situations that have made me feel uncomfortable about it and um, have made me be seen myself as different in a in a bad way, um, other than just my experience with uh, the university and the the athletic attorneys that they had. But like I said, I think, you know, Coach Andrea, he was like, I wish you would have approached me about it sooner. We would have gotten this taken care of. And, um, you know, I kind of let myself be the burden in that situation. And I, I, I don't want to be a burden for having to uh, cause all of this to 
go to attorneys and say, let's make something different. Um, then he was like, the only burden you're putting on is, is yourself. You feel like you're a burden to other people. Let us take care of what we need to take care of to help you. Um, and, and, you know, like I said, it's, it's really hard to find those people like that. And, um, you know, my family did a great job of putting me on the right teams. And, um, I clearly, you know, did, did the best job I could at finding people that have supported me. And I think that, um, that's not always the case. And I, um, I'm sorry for the people that have had to experience the opposite way around, but I'm just fortunate enough to haven't had, have not had that issue in the past, um, or the present that I'm currently experiencing. Everyone should be lucky enough to play for Mike Andrea. <laughs> right. Um, and Kat, you had that opportunity too, but as you think through it and anything you wish, um, coaches would have done or could have done, or even now you see it from different eyes and, you know, you spent years in the dugout too, as a, as a coach, anything that you would suggest coaches think about? Well, I think, you know, rewind, I obviously was in school 14, 15 years ago. So the way the, the avenues we have to advocate for athletes are, are a lot different now, in my opinion. Um, there's more, whether it's sport psychologists or counselors just designated for the athletic department where we didn't have that, um, back then. And, you know, don't get me wrong. Um, I look at it now and again, another situation that I can chalk up to, okay, this was me not being able to handle life. Um, and my anxiety, our academic advisor kind of suggested, Hey, we have a therapist that you can go see if you, if you want to go talk to somebody. And I was like, if, if everyone thinks it's going to help, I'll go. Um, but the one thing, and again, I didn't ever have a, a coach that, um, treated me different because of how I handled my anxiety. But again, going back to coach Clark, like I look at it and I like, did she know without telling me, or was she like telepathic? Because we also had essentially a safe space where we always called it her left field office. And so it was either before practice when I didn't have class that ran up to practice time. Or she, or if I had a rough practice, she would come towards the end and be like, Hey, let's, let's go to the left field office after practice. Um, if you don't have tutoring or anything. And that was, a, that was my safe space to just kind of talk to her about whatever, um, softball school, you know, academic counselor, whatever it was. And more times than not, I was venting about things that probably were without my control. And I got the whole control the controllable talk but I had a safe space to be able to do that. Um, now, I don't know that she did that with as many of my teammates, um, but at the same time, I don't know if they needed it or not. And even if she did, I don't think many of my teammates knew I did that. So she just was, took it upon herself to make sure that she was handling people's needs. And don't get me wrong, obviously I was, I was our pitcher. And so you wanted to make sure I was in a good headspace. but I don't think that was done because it was me. I think it was done because she saw an athlete struggling with, certain situations and was trying to help figure out, okay, how can I guide, how can I guide her? Because I will say by the time I was a junior senior, those left field meetings were a lot less frequent. Um, but she gave me that safe space. And I being on the other side, um, as you mentioned, coaching for 12 years, um, been fortunate to coach under two sides, of, two sides of the spectrum where it's like, you're fine. Keep going, keep going to where, um, I've also had coaches where it's like, Hey, I need this. Kid. Like, I know this kid's battling something. She doesn't want to tell me because I have to make the roster. She didn't necessarily want to tell one of our assistants because she knows the pipeline to the head coach is probably going to happen because if it is something that we need to deal with, like, it's not going to stay, it's not a secret. It shouldn't be a secret. Um, and to where they were like, Hey, I need somebody. And I can't wait a month at the school health center. Like we need to find somebody let's do it. And I think in that realm, I watched a coach truly put her athletes first as people. Um, and I think that's, as a coach, we have to remember, yes, we're there to coach them in softball, but they are humans first. They came into this world as human beings and people first, and eventually learned how to be really good athletes. And we have to remember that that human piece has to go before um, the athlete. And if it means they have to miss a practice to go to a therapy session, or if it means, you know, um, Christy mentioned, I think it was uh, getting her eyesight checked. Like, that's a real thing. There's some athletes that don't realize they don't see well enough until, you know, two or three years into school. And then all of a sudden hitting becomes a little more difficult and just getting your eyes checked and getting contacts or whatever can change night and day. And, you know, um, as a coach, not making a joke of like, Hey, do we need to get your eyes checked? Cause your batting average dropped, but like genuinely thinking, 
could this possibly help? Like, do you have problems with eyesight in your family or whatever? But again, those are human pieces that you have to be interested in and you have to be willing to ask the questions um, and get to know your athletes to know that. And so um, again, you know, like Taylor, I, I benefited having coaches that I think helped me along the way um, and never something where I sit back and I'm like, oh, I wish I would have, I wish I would have gotten this. Um, I wish I would have known about it when I took tests in school and stuff that would have explained a lot. But um, again, that's not something I needed accommodating for. I just needed to learn how to breathe through it. But um, as a coach, we just have to remember the human piece is so much more important. Like the athlete cannot come out if the human piece is going through a tailspin. And I think I learned that more than anything um, last year when this is us and everything, because I was throwing fine. I was throwing bullpens fine. But then we were having meetings to plan what we were going to do and what this and this and that and like on the morning before game. And then I would go throw and I couldn't, I, I pitched so bad. It was embarrassing um, for me. And that was to the point where I, I had to figure out like, what do I need to do? And I realized I needed to put the human first and, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't stay there and keep pitching because there was no way I was going to be successful and that wasn't going to help anybody. Thank you very much. You know, one thing that's been consistent through a lot of these sessions over the last year and a half or more has been the importance of the language that we use and the words that we choose. And it's been on a variety of topics. And sometimes it's scary because you just, you don't know how to say something or what to say. Um, and I'm just curious, uh, Jodell, for, and we'll go around because it's different for everybody, but for coaches who do not have a personal experience to draw from, who have not had an experience with differently abled student athletes, family members, whatever it might be, um, what should coaches be thinking about in the best way to educate themselves, to understand um, to authentically ask the questions or, or provide accommodations that they want to, but are afraid they might mess up. Um, I think that's a really great question. And um, I don't know that I have a great answer, but what I can say is that um, we have this fear of offending and fear of getting things wrong. And I think, so when I'm talking to, to students about disability and the language that we use, um, and, and there's a lot of different ways to refer to disability. There's person first language. Um, there's also identity first language, depending on, you know, what, what people prefer. And so when I'm talking to my students about it, they'll say, I don't even know what to say. Like, I don't know how to, and, and there's this fear. And I said, well, you know, it's, it's a lot less about being right when you do it. And it's a lot more about getting it right. So it, one person with an with an impairment might prefer this um, identity first and be prefer to be called a disabled person. And another one might prefer person first and would like to be a person with a disability. And it's like Kat was saying, it's, it's individualized. You have to think about the people and how they prefer to be referred to. And it's, we're not always gonna get it right. Um, I think at the end of the day, as long as we just acknowledge the fact that disability is complex, life is complex, human beings are complex, and we're not always going to get everything right all the time. I think what matters is our, um, our willingness to listen to others and our willingness to, um, to hear them and then honor what it is that they need and want. Um, that's what matters a lot more. And so as far as language goes, there's a lot of euphemisms we use. And one of those is special needs. That one's really, we're trying really hard to kind of eradicate that one. So I'll share that um, because it doesn't, it doesn't really help. It doesn't, it's not um, descriptive. It's not, it doesn't do anything. And a lot of times people with disabilities will feel like it's infantilizing as well. Um, so we're really trying to work around you know, and, and not being afraid to use the word disability. So we use special needs as a way to kind of soften or make it a little less um, direct, but disability is not a bad thing. And if we're gonna destigmatize that, we have to be able to say the word. So um, we're really kind of working on, on language like that, so. Thank you. And I think there's so much truth to what Kat said earlier about when I was in school 14, 15 years ago, and you think about our own experiences, whether it be elementary school and inclusion or the lack thereof and, and how that continues to change and whether it's mental health or different things like professional sports leagues, not using the word disabled list anymore. 
Um, that took a really long time, you know, to be able to change that terminology when someone was was injured and just different things. So I think even just being aware of of the terms and, and things that are used uh, and just asking the question of does this make sense or is this right? Um, and we're going to go around on this one, but uh, let's start with you, Justin. Are there, are there any things that you would encourage coaches to think about when they're trying to help or provide assistance and, and worried about maybe saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing? Yeah. So I think if you have a deaf or hard of hearing athlete or player at your university who's on your team, the recommendation that I would make is to reach out to either Gallaudet University or the local deaf community. If you don't have any knowledge or understanding about the deaf person to do some research on your own uh, and ask that local deaf community to help you. If you have a deaf or hard of hearing player instead of depending on them for everything. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, Christy, how about you? Thoughts on how coaches can navigate this? And I think Kat alluded to it as well. Um, it's it's I would say build relationships outside of softball. Um, so if you get to know a kid or we do a lot of academic meetings with our players. And so they'll come in, walk through their syllabi and we, um, we talk through and, and you can hear their passion for what they're studying. Um, so you're starting to build relationships, not just can they hit the outside pitch or can they throw a drop ball? It's they're passionate about civil engineering and building a bridge. So you're starting to build a relationship outside of the field and building that trust that's separate from the field. Um, and, and again, I always say we're, we're not friends, we're friendly. So you're, you're, we're, not, we're not best friends, but we are going to uh, uh, be friendly and, and get to know the kid. Um, and then at that point, I think, actually, Joanna, you said it, sometimes it's just a simple, once, you're, once that trust outside of the field is built, you ask, hey guys, I'm not sure how to approach this with you, or I'm not sure, um, or I'm, I'm, there's a couple different ways. What are you comfortable with? And building that relationship can uh, can ease that tension and can make that bridge a little easier to uh, uh, to cross. Thank you very much. Appreciate that, uh, Kat. Let's start with you this time from the player perspective. Any any advice you would give in navigating something that would would possibly be difficult? Well, I think from the player perspective, you don't have to come straight out and say hey, I think you're dealing with this or, hey, you know, in, in Taylor's case, if a coach were like, hey, I don't think like you don't have to come out and address what you think might be causing an issue or using the disability as a crutch or the reasoning right right at the get go. It's more, as Christy just said, have the relationship piece. Um, you know, I, I've referenced Coach Clark many times, but at no point do I ever remember her, her telling me I was overwhelmed or that I might be dealing with anxiety or anything like that. It was literally hey, come, hey, let's come chat. Like, and whether it was she had seen things or not, she didn't have to point that out to me either. It was just a matter of, you know, looking back, I know that there were definitely some hard practices that I got asked to like, hey, stay after and let's, let's sit in left field. Um, but she did it without me really knowing that she was trying to address the issues going on within me that I didn't really want, whether I wanted to, or I just didn't recognize, period. Um, so, but it comes down to, as Chrissy said, making those relationships. I mean, even from the coaching side, those relationships matter because again, if a kid's, for instance, in college, I had a great relationship with Coach Clark and our pitching coach, Marla Looper, to the point that their offices were close to my dorm that I stayed in for the first two years. And in between classes, sometimes I would just pop in the office and sit on the couch for a good 20, 30 minutes, sometimes talking to them, sometimes just reading my book for class, sometimes you know, someone else would pop in and we'd all just joke around or whatever. But again, they weren't my friends, but they were people I trusted to where if I needed to go in and either talk seriously, or even I just needed some time to, to kind of just unload for a little bit. I was comfortable there. And I think that's an environment is you should make an environment to where your, your athletes are comfortable coming to you. And again, not as, not as your, not as their friend, but comfortable enough that they can come to you and you're in a formidable position to where a second to their parents, you're going to have the most access to them. Like it's incredible the amount of impact coaches have because of how much time we spend with them, but they need to be comfortable that they can come to you even with something that's not necessarily sport related. 
Thank you very much. Uh, let's see, Taylor, anything that you want to add on this one with uh, coaches and navigating the territory? Yeah, you know, I think that Christy and Kat for me hit it right on the head. I think just being able to build those relationships um, and, and Kat's right, you know, the coaches are around you all the time, um, pretty much just like your family would be if you were at home all the time, they just don't live with you. But um, I think that it's just, for me, we, everybody that kind of went through Arizona softball program and now that is an alumni just sees coach as our, our second, our second dad. And that's what he was to us, you know, while we were there. And that's what he could still be to majority of us now. Um, and it's, it could just be as simple as, I mean, coach knows everybody's birthday. He writes it in his planner every single year. Every time he gets a new planner, he flips through the old one, writes the birthdays down. And you're always, you're always going to get a, that text on your birthday. Like happy birthday, me and Tina sending you our love or hope you're doing well. Let's catch up soon. Just, just simple stuff. And it, it's, it's as easy as just building relationships. You don't have to be their friend. You know, you can, you can be friendly, but you can also as a coach be yourself. Um, but I think that the, the biggest thing um, that I feel like successful coaches do very well are understanding that not every player they have is the same um, disability or not. Every player is different and being able to um, find that relationship or build that relationship um, together, whether it's, you know, one player or the other, finding that relationship that works for you guys. And I think that, that it's going to do wonders because there's some girls that, you know, don't really feel comfortable all the time going into coach's office, but just having them know that it's accessible and you can go there whenever needed. Um, and, and that's something that I felt like coach Kendra did really well for his players is saying, my office will always be open for you. If I have meetings, somebody comes in, I will make sure that I have the time for you. Um, so it's just building those relationships, making the time for all of your athletes and knowing that all of your athletes are different. Um, and, and, and not all of them can be treated the same because that's just not their style. Not we're, you know, we're not robots. We don't walk around and do the same thing. Like it may feel like we are. So just having that personableness in that relationship is going to be huge. And then that's going to open the doors for trusting the coach to athlete relationship and opening the doors to say, Hey, you know what? Like me as a coach, I don't really know how to help you in this situation? Is this something that you want help with? Is this something that you don't? And it's going to be a lot easier of, of a conversation to have um, because that's what it should be, a conversation. It should be something that's like, hey, this is how you are. Is this something that you want to change or no? Like that's not a conversation. A conversation is being able to openly communicate, not shying away from the situation at hand, but not feeling like there's anything to change or, or address, address either. So, um, I, I think that everybody fed some really solid information that if you put them all together, it's really going to help the, the coaches. It's really going to help the athletes know that these are things that you should want to do as well when you're trying to communicate with your coaches as well. Thank you very much. Uh, we're about due for Samantha chime in. Samantha, anything that you would add for coaches to consider? Well, you know, I love the relationship piece and you know where that starts. That starts the recruiting process, right? That's where you start developing those relationships when you take your time and have conversations and get to know and figure out if this is a good match. So just a reminder there, but, you know, I think it's also important to really understand. And I think Kat said this, like what your role is, you are a coach right? You are a softball coach and you do see these athletes a lot. And so you will probably notice things sooner because you have that daily interaction or that daily observation. It is not your job to conclude or diagnose if there is an issue or, or you know, if there's um, something going on that, but, but, but you do need to be aware of the resources that you have, whether it's in the training room, whether it's sports psychology, to be able to have that safe space in left field, in your office, to bring them in and say, hey, this is what I've noticed. I'm just concerned. Are you okay? You know, let's talk about, would you like to talk about this? And then I want you to make sure you know that we have these resources at the, you know, here, and I can help connect you, you know, and, and try to remove that obstacle um, or that barrier, that feeling of, you know, overwhelmed or where do I go and be a facilitator. So I think sometimes what I see with coaches is they want to fix it. You know, they want to fix the problem. They want to and, and some of these, it really is just you're noticing and you're facilitating a connection to a resource that will be able to hopefully provide 
um, you know, more support or, or maybe even a diagnosis, um, but just remembering that and kind of staying in that space. And Taylor was, you know, was talking about that just now too. Thank you very much. I don't know if anybody would have had the over um, for talking about recruiting from Samantha on plus or minus an hour and 15 minutes. I would have taken the under every day of the week, but there you have it on the chime in. Um, we do have one question left in the chat. So I'm, I'm going to just say it out loud and then we're going to go around for closing thoughts. If you choose to answer that question in closing thoughts, that's fine. If you go in a different direction, that's fine. But uh, the question was, how do we make the softball community um, more available and increase awareness and assistance for those with disabilities in the softball community. So if you want to take that, feel free. If you have something else on your mind, that is perfectly fine too. Um, so we will go through and uh, do closing thoughts from our panelists. Uh, Jodell, let's start with you and then we'll keep that same order. So we'll go Christy, Justin, Taylor, and Kat. Jodell? Um, so in closing thoughts, we've covered a lot of ground <laughs> tonight. So. Um, I think, first of all, I think it's really important that this is even happening, that having a conversation like this, um, it's so important. And to have um, so many different voices, the diversity of the panel is so important. Um, but I would say in closing thoughts, just carrying on beyond this and being able to take what we've talked about here um, and and use it you know, in all of our different areas. So, um, I, I think, um, disability, like I said, disability is really complex. We're not going to solve any, you know, major issues, but I think having the conversation and opening it up and especially in athletics is so incredibly important. Um, so I guess my closing thoughts are just that, um, let's keep doing this somehow, some way. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Christy. Yeah, I, I agree. And, uh, and to go along with it, hopefully answering the question a little bit, but I appreciate the vulnerability on this call. Um, and everyone uh, going in areas that may be comfortable, may not be comfortable, as soon as you got to that point of being comfortable of sharing. I think that's, uh, uh, it hopefully answers a little of the question, how do you continue it on? Um, helping people be vulnerable and, and willing to share, I think uh, it helps you realize you're not alone. I think the other, in terms of closing thoughts, it was interesting, a good, uh, good coaching friend of mine said to me once, um, she goes, Christy, you do what I do, but you have something I don't. You, you do what I do, you coach, I coach. Yet you have MS, you have something I don't. Kind of like own it, that's pretty special. So understanding that a disability isn't necessarily a negative. You do something that I do. You do something that, that I do every day. I go to work, I coach, I do this, I do that. And you do it with a quote unquote disability. And I think that's that, that ownership piece that it doesn't define you. I keep saying that um, just like, oh, you're, you're a softball coach. You're a softball player. You're a, no, that's a part of my life. You're also, you're a parent, you're a, you're a sibling, you're a mother, you're all those things. You have MS, you have these, these disabilities. It's part of, part of who you are. And I think that uh, recognizing that, accepting it, and you know, again, you've got something that uh, if someone else doesn't own it and go on and do your thing. It's a pretty special thing. Thank you, Coach, very much. Appreciate that. Uh, Justin, how about you? Any parting thoughts for the group? Definitely. And I agree with um, Jodell and what Christy had just said as well keeping the dialogue open, educating each other um, in December. I know that we're getting ready to go to the NFCA and I, I wanna make sure that people are not afraid to approach me. Um, you know, it, they think the interpreter is my friend and they talk with the interpreter um, when they could be talking with me. I know that people who can hear might be overwhelmed at the point, but we are not going to bite, right? We are here to answer questions openly about students and athletes who are deaf and hard of hearing because we have that experience. 
Thank you so much, Justin. And uh, Justin, if you don't know him, he's a super NFCA member. You will see him at an NFCC. You will see him at a pre-con. You will see him at convention. So you will have many opportunities uh, to say hello and introduce yourself. He is he is uber passionate about learning and growing, and, and we're just thrilled to have him as part of our group. So uh, thank you, Coach. Appreciate your time and, and transparency today. Uh, let's see. Taylor, you're up. Yeah, you know, I think Justin said this uh, about an hour ago or so. One of his first comments was, I think that we can't just let this discussion be a one time thing. And, you know, everybody else that has just talked said the same thing. Um, but it is true. Just just one month or one Zoom call panel isn't going to be enough to get the point of cross to make the changes that are necessary. Um, and I think that on top of that, just not letting a disability define who you are, um, but not being afraid to let it define how you choose to be an athlete or a coach um, and or live your everyday life. So I think there's a difference between letting something define you and you being able to use that as a stepping stone or that extra benefit, because that's something else that you know more about than other people. Um, and you'll be able to share and, and spread your knowledge or use your knowledge to, you know, what Christy was saying, be, a, be an awesome coach and take that extra step in that initiative to learn or be a little bit more educated on how to communicate with your with your athletes and and that's huge um and i think that the softball community is as as large as it is and as big as it's getting it's still small um and and people um at all levels know other people at all levels so it's awesome to be able to have the community that we do to be able to continue to share our knowledge and spread the knowledge and let everybody else be able to say hey like we're, we're in this with you what can we do to um grow our our i guess grow our knowledge of the game in a different light and what can we do to then continue to pass it along to others um and i think that that's the biggest thing the softball community can take out of this as a whole um you know as well as um everything else that the other panelists have said tonight everything else is 100 percent true um and and just being able to listen to everybody's stories and um everything that everybody else has been through has been super awesome so thank you the rest of the panelists for sharing your stories as well thank you very much um uh, cat i don't know how far back we have to go to your days as a cleanup hitter but you get to do it tonight so um any closing thoughts do you have or anything you would like to add that's a long time ago um no, I think to answer the question about, you know, what, how can the software community, um, what can be done basically is, is again, it's the relationships and cultivating an environment where um, conversation is a good thing. Um, and, and teaching, I think, obviously, I'm sure we have a number of different level of coaches from travel ball all the way through college on, but like cultivating conversation and teaching kids what's the correct vocabulary to use, what is the correct um, situational awareness to be able to have these conversations. And, um, you know, and again, in my case with anxiety, it's not like I just walk around and every time someone meets me, I'm like, hi, I'm Kat. I have anxiety. Like it's not how it goes, but a lot of times I'll start to feel stressed or pressured. Does your athlete have either you as a coach or a teammate or someone where she, they can be like, it's coming, like it's coming. Just help me breathe, help me calm down, whatever it is. Um, but allowing the athlete to be able to, to verbalize what they are going through if they want to, and not making it, it's not taboo anymore. It's not, it's, it's, you know, we've seen too many athletes that have been dealing with it for a long time and are starting to come forward with it, which is great. But in our own softball community, allowing athletes to talk about what they are feeling and truly what they're feeling, whether it's with softball or if it's mom and dad, you know, screaming their head off at them that they can't even play softball, whatever it is, give them that space to come, to have the conversation as a coach, be open to the conversation, knowing that you don't have all the answers and it's okay. Sometimes you don't have to have the answer. You just have to be an ear. And, um, I think that's the biggest thing and, you know, get to know your athletes and just remember that they're, they're, they're people first, um, as someone who, like I said, three weeks ago, stepped away from playing the sport. Um, there were definitely times where even myself didn't see myself as a, a human and a person first. It was always softball player. And I think that probably, added to it to me for some at some point um but remember to let your athletes know that they're people and you love them as people whether they hit a grand slam strikeout whatever it is and i know we say that all the time but 
Um, I've been fortunate. I had a lot of coaches that did do that. Um, and you know, Taylor hit it. Coach Kinder is one of them. And I can attest, I get the birthday text every year. Um, I think I get an anniversary text now too. So, um, he knows what goes on in his players' lives, no matter how much you played for him or not, which is really cool because I wouldn't think I'm one of his because I didn't go to Arizona. In fact, I, I told him no, which might've, I don't know. I don't want to say it was a mistake. Everything works out the way it's supposed to, but, um, just have that, have that, that connection with your athletes that they know they're people, you understand they're people and humans that happen to be really good at softball. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to all the panelists that took the time to share their stories and uh, in true transparency and candor. And we're just greatly appreciative of everything you do for the softball community uh, and for the greater community that you're all a part of. So we appreciate you and your time. If you are looking for other forums and other content that's similar in nature, we have a variety of options. You can get those at nfca.org under the forums page on our website. They're always free and open to everyone. You don't have to be a member, a softball coach or anything like that. Uh, we're thrilled to just have some part in carrying the conversation forward and hopefully um, creating a space where people can come together, think, ask tough questions and advance themselves um, as a group and individually as well. So we will be back in November with a webinar. Uh, we're going to talk about incorporating mental strategies into your program, be it in the daily practice plan or in other facets of the game. So make sure that you come back in November. Check that out, November 16th. Until then, a big thank you to all. And we appreciate it. Have a wonderful rest of your evening and we will see you next time. Thanks everybody.